Hi there, everybody, and welcome to today's Art of Procurement podcast. I'm Philip Heidson, the founder and managing director of Art of Procurement. And as we all know, it's a really exciting time to be in procurement, especially with the pace of technological change. And so today's podcast is part of a special sponsored series that's taking part over the last two weeks of January 2020, where we aim to shine a light on the emerging and growth companies who are changing the way that leading procurement teams are driving outcomes that truly align with corporate objectives. And so we're going to ask an entrepreneur from eight different companies questions about what gap in the market their solution addresses how they differentiate their technology, and what the tools look like in action. It's a great way for you to get to know those who are truly leading the way when it comes to the digitization of procurement. And so in today's podcast, I talked to Alan Holland of Kielvar, and I first asked Alan to share Kielvar's elevator pitch. Kielvar provides advanced sourcing software for enterprises. We provide a sourcing optimizer product so companies can run large or complex sourcing projects. We also provide a new solution, intelligent sourcing automation for tactical buying. So for higher frequency, less complex sourcing projects, sor- sourcing bots can automate the execution from beginning to end Interesting. of RFQs or auctions. And we have two variants of automation, a level four automation that follows the prescriptive process. And we have level five automation where machine learning can uh, train the bot to find smarter and smarter strategies Mm -hmm. so that it can drive greater and greater value. So I wonder if you could... um share some like an example or a use case for each one of those so that listeners can actually visualize what that looks like what it looks like in practice so a use case for optimization and use case for automation is that yes please yeah so uh, one use case for optimization a classic example is transportation where you could have hundreds of lanes Mm -hmm. and you have to deal with multiple suppliers because no no single supplier will serve all your needs and they don't have the coverage you may require yeah so you you have to gather bids on individual lanes and there could be hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands if you're a large enterprise of these origin destination pairs and gathering all of that data from what could be dozens or hundreds of suppliers is very time consuming. Right. So optimization is about collecting data in a structured way and an optimizer will find the best value for money outcome for you. And so you can kind of direct the outcome as well. So you can add constraints and say, mm-hmm. I, I only want seven suppliers or I want to keep 50% with incumbents. The optimizer will uh, respect those uh, constraints and preferences and find the optimal outcome. So another, and then the use case for automation, it would be, let's say you have tactical buyers buying ingredients yeah. or professional services, and you have high, higher frequency of sourcing events. So, and each one is of smaller value, but it takes time to set up an RFQ or an auction and run that process. So instead of having somebody in procurement gathering information from a requester about what what it is they want to buy, that they converse with a chatbot and say, this chatbot is a sourcing bot. Mm -hmm. So it's gathering, it's a structured conversation where it asks all the pertinent questions and it finds out what it is you're going to buy, what you want to buy. And the bot will decide who are the most appropriate suppliers to invite, what's the most appropriate bidding mechanism, what data cleansing rules should be applied, and what scenarios should be evaluated and reported back to the requester as the options with a recommendation to say, this is our recommended option, uh, but which one do you want to choose? Interesting. And Procurement only has to decide to approve if they want an approval step to say, 
we approve of this. And uh, otherwise, they have no work to do whatsoever in that tactical line. So the questions that the bot would ask for the uh, requisitioner, are those kind of conditional? So based on how they would answer, it would then change the next question to them? Or is it pretty structured? Exactly. You know, this is a five steps. We're going to ask these same five questions every time. It's a decision tree based upon the responses gathered. So the appropriate questions it should ask will depend upon the data it's collecting as it goes. And the actions then it takes in the sourcing process are depend upon the information gathered. So it's, um, it is intelligent automation where actions are contingent upon the actual data being processed. Right. And so do you, so for example, then when, when it recommends to you, these are the suppliers uh, that you should consider, is that from a, um, a pre-approved like procurement list or is it something from the database that you have collected? Uh, can it be either or, you know, depending on how uh, an organization wants to configure it? What does that look like? So the, and there's a kind of a rules-based approach amongst a set of qualified suppliers at present. That's the way it's working today. Mm -hmm. And we envisage that in the future, it will be recommending suppliers that you should consider inviting that may not be in your list of qualified right. suppliers. So that's the that's not that's not where it is today, but yeah. uh, later this year, that's where it will be. Yeah, to head towards like supplier discovery. Uh, I imagine at, at at some point when you have um, the data to do so as well, you can start seeing who other folks are using um, and build that into the kind of machine learning logic. Um, to recommend that for this kind of category, these are the suppliers that are used the most, for example, and it's not a supplier that you're using today. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is this is a key thing and why uh, um, intelligent automation is so superior to robotic process automation mm -hmm. that uh, you, you can learn from historical bid events and you can start to learn across organizations. So instead of, let's say somebody's going to market and it's a road freight bid in California, that if it's a road freight bid in California, they should only be recommended suppliers that have been competitive on lanes in California. Yeah. And a, the recommender should uh, be basing recommendations based on the semantics of past road freight events where it has inspected the origin destination pairs and it knows what carriers are bidding on lanes in California. Mm -hmm. So uh, for, for intelligent recommendations to be valuable, uh, that's, that's the level of sophistication that is required. So, and I would say this is a very important aspect of automation is that people only want automation when it will deliver superior results right. and somebody who would, doing, who would operate the same process manually. That's interesting from a change management perspective that that's what you see. That it's not necessarily to make the process more efficient, but only when they know there's additional value over and above that. Exactly, because there will always be opponents of automation and those that argue that, oh, the job won't be done as well by a boss. And you have to be in a position to counteract uh, uh, credibly uh, counteract those objections mm -hmm. and say the bot does deal with the nuances that a human expert would deal with too and that it can deliver that standard that a human expert can deliver, but it can also deliver greater speed, greater scale, um, uh, and, uh, and must be cheaper to operate. So it must, it must win on all counts. Mm -hmm. it, it's uh, a Pareto optimal, if I would say. It, it, whatever a, a, a dimension you, you judge it by, it needs to be better than the human um, because uh, to overcome that objection. So you mentioned uh, from a sourcing optimization perspective, logistics is one of the kind of key areas where there's the where the complexity exists, um, that there is 
there's it's so much value added in running it through a um um, a different process, if you will. I just wonder if there's other categories that you often see that lend themselves to sourcing optimization software like you uh, have at Kilva. Yeah, so uh, the, the, because transport is the most common because people just simply run into big trouble with large events and they must have an alternative. But there are many other categories that may not be as large or complex but can see bigger benefits in terms of either savings or speed. And some of those categories include the likes of temporary labor, uh, parts, materials, um, a, a facilities management, and um, packaging. So uh, any categories where you need to contract with a multiplicity of suppliers and yeah. how, how you blend those in the optimal way that's where you should be introducing optimization. Even if it's even if you're doing things and it's feasible to do it in Excel, when you move to optimization, you'll see faster process, bigger savings, and much better strategic oversight in the trade-offs and managing the trade-offs between cost and non-cost objectives. So it, it's a false economy to think, and, and I would say still to this day, majority of large organizations think that they're saving money by using Excel to manage um, some of these projects mm -hmm. that are in Excel. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible false economy. Uh, that's costing them so much money indirectly. So for folks who you who will come to Kilvar and uh, they're interested in using the um, sourcing optimization technology, for example, that you have, do you typically do that on a project basis? Or do you, you recommend people start with, with one particular project as a proof of concept? Or, you know, how do folks usually engage with you? So the, it depends on whether they've used optimization before. Mm -hmm. Any company that's used optimization before, they already understand the business case. They understand the, the value. And they're typically switching from another vendor because, they, they, they want, let's say, it, their, their um, aim is maybe to increase adoption of optimization. Yeah. And because we focus on ease of use and uh, we've had a, a huge emphasis on UX in our development of our app, that that's what we focus on and uh, getting twice as many users on board or twice as many events is typically a name. But if an organization has not used optimization before, then you have to kind of help them understand the significance of what they've, they've been missing out on. So it's aiming for, for a proof of concept where a proof of concept might involve, it's typically more than one project, might be three projects. Mm -hmm. that, and we deliberately encourage companies to do a, uh, go for breadth. You know, yes, transportation should be one, but you should, definitely look at at least two other categories so that you get a sense of the breadth of applicability yeah. of optimization um, because there's a real danger you get pigeonholed as the uh, transportation solution and some right. organizations go for years you know, just looking for transportation yeah. and not realizing they're missing out elsewhere um, and it's just a um, that that's a trap that organizations should be should not fall into so do you find that, you know, there's a lot of talk within procurement and uh, looking at priorities for 2020 about automation. Is that something that you're seeing that that truly there is a, a renewed interest in uh, automation from the procurement leadership community? Yes, our feedback from CPOs has been that most CPOs we've spoken to is that automation is their number one priority for 2020. And the key challenges that they're saying to us that they have are around the instructions they're receiving from board level is that there's, there's no more recruitment allowed or that they need to uh, do more with fewer fewer numbers of persons, mm -hmm. uh, smaller teams. and But they're being asked to increase the coverage of um, spend management. So they're effectively trying to do more with less. And for those companies, automation is the key to unlocking that um, to unlocking that capability. 
Well, Ellen, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining me today on the pod. I have one last question, and that's just that if anyone who's listening, um, they've had their interest piqued by the potential of automation and intelligent automation in the procurement space um, around uh, sourcing optimization, where's the best place for them to find out a little bit more and, and learn more about Kielvar? Uh, we, we have a resources section in our website on kielvar.com with things like white papers on automation and what it's all about. And uh, we'd be happy to share examples of use cases as well. So um, we work with companies on getting started in just individual categories in automation because we realize that there's an education aspect to this where organizations are trying to understand what's different, right. what's the difference between RPA and intelligent automation. And what can intelligent automation deliver above and beyond robotic process automation? And I think when companies see the significance of automated systems that that have AI and like have reasoning about the data passing through the system, then they'll be impressed. All right. Well, what I'll, what I'll do, Alan, is I'm going to link up to uh, that resource center. Uh, from your website on our show notes page that will accompany today's episode. For any listener who wants to go there, that'll be at atprocurement.com slash podcast. And then just search for Startup Series or uh, Kielva, and you'll find the links uh, directly to that resource center. So, Alan, just one last time, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for tuning in to this special startup series on the art of procurement. To listen to the entire series and for the show notes pages that accompany each episode, please go to artofprocurement.com slash startup series. 